Let's talk about the word divide for just a moment. When you hear that word, what pops into your head? Anyone? Math. Math. Yeah. It literally means to separate, to make less than whole. And then there's all that other stuff, right? It's how our past experiences and the way we see the world add even more personal definition to that word. And let's face it, unless you're a mathematician, it's a loaded word with a whole lot of negative connotations. And yet it's one of the most commonly used words we see when we read about or we hear when we talk about. Multiple generations working side by side in the workplace, collaborating in our classrooms, having discussions on social media, or just hanging out. Language is powerful. The words we choose matter. And when we put that word divide front and center, sometimes with a big spotlight on it, we create a narrative that at best is misleading and distracting, and at its worst is actually detrimental. It's damaging and it's divisive. It assumes that for us to have authentic and robust and productive relationships, we have to first overcome something. At its core, it's a flawed proposition. Because when we focus on this idea that I call the myth of the generational divide, we ignore a fundamental truth. And that truth is this. Regardless of age and experience, we have much more in common that connects us than divides us. It's not, as my friend Sean would say, rocket surgery. I'm not the first, and I certainly won't be the last person to say it. And yet, it's almost always overlooked, it's underestimated, and it's certainly undervalued. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can change the narrative. We can engage in an honest conversation about what it means to look for, appreciate, and leverage the things that we have in common. Now, for some people, that may sound like a Captain Obvious moment, but all we have to do is look around. And we can see that what we have in common has taken a backseat to our differences. So I'm here today to set the record straight, or at least the record as I see it, and take you on a generational journey of sorts to explore some aha moments, investigate how we got here to this idea of the generational divide, and answer that big question, so what now? Now, four years ago, a client called me and asked me to help create a program about generations in the workplace. And that one call kicked off a whole flurry of activity, a lot of research, a lot of reading, and a lot of interviews. Because I needed to know what leaders were thinking, I needed to know what employees were saying and experiencing, and I needed to know what the research was telling folks about this topic. Here's what I quickly learned. Think of it like the headline of a newspaper, right? And that headline almost always had three words in it, generations, divide and differences. And underneath that headline, it almost always unfolded the same way. Generational differences create a divide. Now in my gut, I knew that that story wasn't quite complete, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I let it simmer for a little bit. And a couple days later, I got up and packed my stuff and went to my mobile office, also known as Starbucks. And I walked into Starbucks and the 20-something millennial behind the bar waved at me and said, whose name, by the way, is Dakota, waves at me and says, hey, Ryan, what can I get started for you? So I gave him my order. And as he's giving me my change, he looks at my awesome shirt and says, dude, I love your shirt. Pink Floyd rocks. And without really thinking, I said, yes, my millennial friend, they do. And then it got kind of awkward. <laughs> So I sat down. Now remember when I said we have much more in common that connects us than divides us? That was my aha moment. And it was all about music. How many of you love music? Yeah. I've never had anybody stand up and say, music sucks! <laughs> because music, some would say, connects us at a cellular level. It's the soundtrack to our lives. And then I thought about that 
number one song, Pink Floyd's number one song from 1979. I was 10 years old and had a beautiful full head of brown hair. I know, take a second to picture it. And that was my favorite song. And guess what? I'm going to sing part of it. And I know some of you know the words, and so I want you to sing along with me. Hey, teachers, leave us kids alone. It was the quintessential coming of age song for a generation called X. But it's those next two lines in that song that brought it together for me, and I hope it does for you too. All in all, it's just another brick in the wall. All in all, you're just another brick in the wall. Wow. Pretty deep stuff for a song that when I was 10 years old thought was just about those teachers. All these years later, that song helped me realize that when we put our differences first, it's like putting another and another and another brick in a wall that we've created. So I took those aha moments and insights and some really great memories, and I sat down with that client and created that program. It was really successful, and we had a whole lot of fun. And I'll tell you what, it was so much fun, and I got so much out of those experiences that I decided to set out on a longer and larger journey to inquire, to investigate, and to share what I'm still learning about all of us. And so as I continued to ask a lot of questions, I'm kind of annoying that way, there was one big question up, up there hanging out that I needed to answer, and that was how did we get here to this idea or myth of the generational divide? Now to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the 1960s, 1968 to be exact. Some of you were there. I was, well, let's just say I was on my way. Life Magazine published a cover story about what was then called the generational gap. And the generation gap referred to challenges and tensions that were occurring between children and their parents. And it was driven largely by our involvement in Vietnam and Watergate and facilitated in large part by music, film, and literature. There are two iconic phrases associated with that time, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, peace, love, and understanding. Now fast forward to the late 1980s into the mid-1990s, and another generation was coming of age, Generation X. They were entering the workforce in much smaller numbers than their baby boomer predecessors, but interestingly enough, are closely aligned with, sometimes even blamed for, that generation gap growing into a generational divide. Certainly there were social and cultural changes. The AIDS crisis, the Challenger disaster, Divorce and latchkey kids were milestones. And the art certainly reflected and facilitated the changing times. But there was one new ingredient in the mix, and it changed everything. It was technology. Technology, specifically, and the pace of innovation that was happening at such a fast rate that we'd never seen before. The younger generation was better prepared because they had more access to and became more fluent in new technology when they entered the workforce than their elder peers who were already there. And add to that an older generation who, to some degree, were left out in the cold because they had already left the workforce and, by extension, weren't naturally exposed to that new technology, much less had an opportunity to adopt and adapt to it Ironically, if there ever was a generational divide, that's when it happened. Because technology wasn't always user-friendly, it wasn't intuitive, and it wasn't smart. But now fast forward to the mid-2000s, when millennials are entering the workforce, and here's something fascinating that happened. That divide quickly closed because technology became intuitive. It became user-friendly, and it became smart-enabled. And yet, that myth of the generational divide persists. In fact, it spawned a whole bunch of little, little smaller, well, sometimes bigger myths, including two of these biggies. 
The first one is what I call, and it's really two sides of the same coin, the they're changing the world. They'll never amount to anything myth. And when I see headlines like this, I just have to wonder about all the other generations that have and continue to change the world. And when I see an entire generation labeled as lazy, they'll never amount to anything, I look at my fellow Gen Xers and say, look what they said about us. Now the second myth is what I like to call the triple M myth. Me, me, me. You know, myths are rooted in truth. And this one's no exception. We're an individualistic society. We encourage sometimes require self-reflection, self-development, and self-focus, particularly when we're young, right? When we're discovering who we are and charting our path in life. So it's unfair to label an entire generation selfish or use that as an indicator of future behavior. Those labels aren't just misleading and distracting. They are, in fact, damaging to our relationships and they're divisive. When we see words like this, materialistic, selfish, lazy, and arrogant, used to describe our millennial friends, our colleagues, our family members, I ask folks to do one simple thing, and I'm gonna ask you to do it too. Look around you. The words we choose matter. So as we wrap up our time together and I go off and continue my generational exploration, I think we all need to ask that big question, so what now? It's a good question. I think we have an opportunity to rediscover and reclaim what we have in common and put it first. We here in Iowa have a lot in common. Sometimes we need to be nudged just a little bit to dig a little bit further to find it. Sometimes we need to be reminded. But we come together that when, because regardless of age and experience and all the other things that we have in common, we found and we stand firmly on common ground. You can see it every day, every hour, in every community in this great state. But we have a new tradition that brings together three of the greatest things that we Iowans have in common. A love and commitment to our children and kids everywhere. Iowa nice. And a love for college football that's unsurpassed. And that tradition began right here in Iowa City, home of the Iowa Hawkeyes. You see, when we look for, appreciate, and leverage the things that we have in common. Even the most simple, seemingly simple of things, like a wave, can have a profound impact. I also think that we have an opportunity to rethink how we look at our differences. Not as challenges and obstacles, but as assets and tools that make us collectively better. And today, I can't think of a better example than these two men who were once rivals in a race to become President of the United States. In his remembrance of the late Senator John McCain, former President Barack Obama made note of the many differences they had, including age and experience. But he took great care to highlight the many things that they had in common that enabled them to work together for love of country. So if you're still not convinced, I'll leave you with this story. I found this story a couple years ago when I was leafing through the Des Moines Register. And I found this story about Liz and Phil, both in their late 80s, celebrating their one year anniversary. And they decided to spend that evening in the front row surrounded by thousands of screaming preteens and teenagers at a Taylor Swift concert. Liz and Phil remind us that age is just a number and that what really matters is our shared interests and our shared experiences because we are, after all, stronger together 
when we are standing, or in this case, dancing, on common ground. Thank you.